All right. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for everyone who gathered this evening. We thank you for seeing everyone, some people we haven't seen in a while, and we're so glad to see them here. Um, We pray for tonight that you would give us insight into your word, wisdom into your word, and, and not only would we understand the content and the structure and sentences and the words, but we also would understand our own heart and our own spirit how you want to use this word as the living word that that uh, transforms us, that's meant to transform our lives. So we pray for that. We count on your Holy Spirit uh, tonight and pray these things in Christ's name. Well, it was awfully nice, by the way, to hear all of you sing tonight. You know, you think about all the words and singing that go on in our culture and so much of it is absolutely profane. And to hear a group of Christians get together and sing to the Lord, particularly that last one, holy, 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 is just a very beautiful. And I, I think our Lord is happy to hear us sing to him that way. So, yeah, he does. Okay, so remember, we're in the book of Judges. Judges. <laughs> Chapter 15 we're going to take tonight, and, uh, you know, we're continuing to endeavor to work through uh, the the story of Samson. You know, as I said last week, it's interesting that, that of all the book of Judges, 25% of it is, is dedicated to Samson, mm-hmm. and yet if you look at it, you will see, and as we've been seeing, that this is a story of a man's life who started out in the most unique way. There are very few people that have had the beginning that Samson had. He was predicted by the angel of the Lord. He was given to his mother and father. They were told to make him a Nazarite. He was going to supposedly and I'm going to say supposedly because I think you'll see further tonight, this isn't what really happens. He was supposed to lead his people. He was supposed to deliver at least a portion of the nation because, of course, the the judges were mostly regional. Um, But somehow none of those things very much came to fruition in Samson's life. So, you know, I want to read for you. You don't necessarily have to turn here, but I want to read from Ecclesiastes 7-8 to start. Because I think this is really the theme, not only of what we want to talk about tonight, but it's the theme of Samson's life. In Ecclesiastes 7, 8, says, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. And of course, so many times we have these examples in Scripture. Now, one of the things I think that tells us There are many things that tell us about the divine nature of Scripture, how it's structured in a divine way. But one of the things, I think, that endorses that divine structure is the reality of the stories. These are not stories about wonderful people that always do wonderful things in a wonderful way, and they always follow God, and they never do anything wrong. That's not what we read. We read very real human stories. Some of them become wonderfully victorious through the transformation of God's influence, the Holy Spirit. And some of them become incredibly tragic because the opposite occurs. For instance, turn, if you would. I'm going to make you move around your Bible again here a little bit. Turn to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. And we're going to read, starting in verse 19. In 18, we have this remarkable experience where the Lord himself shows up to Abraham and Sarah's home, two angels occurring 
coming with him. They are greeted. They eat a meal together. A prophecy is made about a, a birth that will occur, okay, that they will have this son that's been promised them for now basically 10 years at this point, basically. And, of course, then the two angels, the Lord leaves, the two angels then go down to Sodom, all right? And, of course, they try to minister there to the family of Lot, Lot, his wife, daughters, and I believe also the son-in-laws, if I remember it correctly. They warn them about what they're going to do. And, of course, it talks about the nature of this community. It's lascivious, sinful, horrific in nature. And, of course, they literally the angels have to grab them by the hands, it says in the text, to drag them out of the city into the mountain area so that the angels can then thoroughly destroy the city. They don't want to leave this place, even though it's horrific. It's so horrific that God does something very unusual. He just completely annihilates it, almost like a nuclear blast from heaven that craters it, literally. I think we pretty much know from the geography and the topography. It is. It's in the Dead Sea area. Okay? And what happens? They have this miraculous event, and then they go to the mountains, and... Yeah, let's go to, uh, let's start maybe in verse 30. Uh, uh, and he says, And Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains with his two daughters with him, for he was afraid to stay in Zoar, and he stayed in a cave, and he and his two daughters. Now think of this next this part. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old. And there's not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of the earth. Which I think is a stretch, because they know Abraham is around, and he has certain relatives, okay, at any rate. And he says, come, let us make our father drink wine, and let us, uh, and let us lie with him, that we may preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went and lay with their father, and he did not know when, he, when she lay down or when she arose. Verse 34, and it came about on the, on the morrow to, uh, that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I, I lay with, the fa- with our father. So tonight, so they do it again, okay? So verse 35, so they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger also lay with him, and he did not know it when she lay down where she got. Thus both the daughters of Lot was child by their father, and the firstborn bore a son, and his name was Moab, and he is the father of the Moabites to this day, and as for the younger, she also bore a son and called him Ben-Ami, he is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. Now, think of the import of this. For a thousand years at least, Israel suffers from the Moabites and the Ammonites. They are their perpetual enemies, a snare to them, all because these two girls decided that even though God could miraculously send angels and miraculously destroy this horrible place, somehow God could not cause them to have children by his way. And so they do it by their way. And the results are horrific. So we see this tendency. So often what, when there's a beginning that is good, that is faithful, that's miraculous, then a time comes of great testing. And then the decision comes. Do we follow or we not follow? Do we continue in the way of the Lord in faith and step in faith, or do we do it ourselves, our own way, because we really need to help God? You know? um, and, and this is the principle that we see here with Samson. Now, 
there's a New Testament application to this. So I want you to turn into the New Testament to 1 Corinthians 9. This is a great admonition by Paul, and it's an important one. 1 Corinthians 9, and we're going to start in verse 23. He says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may be become a fellow partaker of it. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, and only one receives the prize, run in such a way that you may win? He's speaking of the analogy of the Greek Olympics here. And he says, and everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do so to receive a perishable wreath, which is what they would put on their head if they won, or one of the three that won, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim, I box in a way as to not just beat the air, you know, foolishly flailing, as opposed to strategically hitting, but I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly, after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. He's talking about, obviously, not only his life, but our lives, that we're supposed to run the race with endurance to the very end. Turn over a little bit further to your right to the book of Philippians. And this is another great admonition by Paul in this area. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 17. I'm sorry. I'm going to start in verse 7, not 17. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, literally dung, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may, and here's the key, that I may know him, I'd like to put in there, truly know him, in the power of his resurrection. And here's the next one we don't like as well, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Mm -hmm. But they're as important also. Being conformed to his death. Now think about that. We are to be conformed to his death, the principle of dying. Why? Because only out of the principle of dying comes the resurrected life, okay? Being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And then Paul says in 12, not that I've already obtained it or have already become teleos, perfected, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. Think of that phrase. I press on in order that I may lay hold of, of that which he already laid hold of in me, in other words. He says, brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to start well, we're supposed to finish well. And that's sadly what we'll see doesn't happen here in the life of Samson. So let's read, now you might want to go back to actually our text, 
in Judges. And let's read the first three verses. 15. 15. He says, But after a while, in the time of the wheat harvest, it came about that Samson visited his wife. I think you would want to put in there, quotes, wife. It's kind of a, you'll see, strange kind of arrangement situation there. He, uh, and he, he visited his wife and brought her a young goat as a present and said, I'll go into my wife in her room. And her father did not let him enter. And her father said, I really thought that you hated her intensely. So I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she let her, uh, please let her be yours instead. But Samson then said to them, this time I shall be blameless in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So, notice after his previous encounter, what does he do? If you'll remember at the end of chapter 14, actually it's in verse 19, and he and after it's done and it's yeah. dropped off then he goes uh, home yeah. mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. he's mad that she conned him and they pressured her to give the riddle up mm -hmm. that he lost the bet so he goes down and gets into a street brawl 30 miles away, okay, kills 30 Philistines, brings all of their expensive clothing, drops it off, even though he was really kind of in the middle of a Philistine marriage ceremony, and he goes home, okay? He's mad, mm -hmm. all right? So now we're seeing in 15, now he decides to come back, all right, and he's going to try to uh, reignite this flame, as it were, this relationship. So he wants to consummate the marriage, but of course he's already jilted the bride at this point. Her father points out, of course, that it was Samson's fault that he didn't continue the process and fully marry her, and as a result of his inaction, and, of course, his pouting at home, he loses the bride to another man. And it's interesting that he doesn't say in response to this or to the father, you know, this is really not a good thing for me to do. I didn't really handle this well. That's not what he says. Mm -hmm. But rather, he takes the attitude that despite his actions and his, and his attitude, he still deserves to marry her, all right? So he decides that he's going to get revenge as a result because someone else got his bride. He's been cheated. And, of course, it's the old, you know, well-worn and overworn sentiment that we see in our culture. It's not fair. fair, okay? The entitlement mentality, which is so sadly pervasive, so, rather than seeing his wrong, he responds in anger. And he decides, what we said, to get revenge. Now, in Israel, in late April, early May, is the wheat harvest. Obviously, since it's the wheat harvest, the stalks are dry, the kernels are full at the top, and, of course, the fields, therefore, are very combustible. It's fairly easy to burn them at this time. Matter of fact, if you even think about it, if you've ever noted agriculturally, uh, sometimes when they store wheat flour, if they get a spark, what happens? It'll blow a silo apart pretty dramatically. Okay, so this can be an, an ex, uh, explosive thing. Now, let's read verses 4 through 8. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches and turned the foxes tail to tail 
and put one torch in the middle between two tails. When he'd set the fire to the torches, he released the foxes into the standing grain of the Philistines, thus burning up both the shocks and the standing grain along with the vineyards and the groves. Then the Philistines said, who did this? And they said, Samson, the, quote, son-in-law of the Temanite, because he took his wife and gave her to his companion. So the Philistines came and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, since you act like this, I will surely take revenge on you. But after that, I will quit. And I'm going to add to that, don't bet on it. Okay. And he struck them ruthlessly with a great slaughter. And he went down and lived in the cleft of the rock of Etom. So let's kind of pull this one apart and see what's going on. The word there that is translated foxes is the word, is the word shual in the Hebrew, and it probably means jackals rather than foxes. I say that it can be interpreted either way, but if you look at the number of verses where this word is used, and I'm not going to go to all of them, we'll go to the last one, but you'll see the same mention of this in Lamentations 5.18. You'll see it mentioned in Ezekiel 13.4. And you'll see it also mentioned in Psalm 63.10. Why don't you turn to the Psalm 63.10 verse, and let's look at the word there. Psalm 63. Okay. You'll see it in verse 10. They will be delivered over the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes. Now, in the other verses, you also see that there's a connotation of judgment or devastation along with this, which fits better with the jackals, because in other references to jackals, you have them like in the book of Isaiah, I think it's in 26. Michael, I'm trying to remember. You taught that. I think it's in 26 where he talks about the jackals there, too. Right, and they're, uh, it's usually a reference to um, animals that are indwelt by demons. Yeah, they, they are frequently, yeah. particularly in that chapter. They're not always. But... Right. But it, it's kind of in reference to this a devastation is occurring or going to occur, and the jackals gather, okay? And it seems to be that's more the, the reference here. Now, the word caught is the word lekad in Hebrew, and it means literally to be trapped in a snare. So apparently he traps these, you know, 150, or no, 300, 150 pairs, 300 jackals. And then apparently he ties a torch, which is possibly a small clay pot with an ember that's inside of it. So he has a fire he's made. He puts these hot embers probably in this. And, of course, then he ties this in between the two tails that he's tied together. And I think you would imagine you're talking about some fairly terrified pairs of animals at this point. And then he sends them right into the wheat field. Yeah. So horrible to do that to the animals. Well, may, yeah, maybe they escaped. I don't know, but and if well, it says he trapped them. I you know, the word indicates he trapped them. He's planning a revenge here. Now, now, no, a jackal is a is a small, almost dog like, almost like a coyote, if you want to think of it, kind of that way. So. What you see here is very interesting. It also says not only do they send them into the into the wheat fields, but it sends them into the vineyards, okay? And then it says they also ran into the groves. Now, groves is a very specific word. It's the word zaith in Hebrew, and it means literally olive trees. Now, if you can imagine 
olive trees. Think about it. Olive oil. Olive oil is very burnable, combustible. I mean, that's what was used in the menorah, right, to light it, olive oil, fine olive oil. So, you know, this fire must have been, I think, because of this, horrific. I mean, he must have set this place absolutely in a blaze. Uh, you know, I almost think, when I think about this, I almost think about pine cones in a pine forest. I mean, pine resin is so combustible. We use it every time we make a fire. We use pine cones because <laughs> it'll make a fire almost instantly. You know, a pine forest that is set ablaze is a horrific fire. And I think this is the indication of what goes on here, too. So he creates a massive... Yes. But he destroyed a whole year's worth of food. He did. Absolutely did. Yeah, turn, matter of fact, it's good you point that out. You're, you're thinking my direction. To turn to the prophet Haggai. You're going to have to go past Daniel, past Amos, past Nahum, past Habakkuk. To the prophet Haggai, and I want you to look at chapter 1, verse 11. I think this amplifies what Gary just said. You got it? Still trying to find Haggai. Kind of small prophet. You only have a couple chapters, yeah, in the Okay, so chapter 1, verse 11, it says, and this is God rebuking Israel at this point. He says, I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains. Notice what he then says, on the grain, on the new wine, and on the oil, on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and all the labor of your hands. So he indicates three major goods, consumer goods that are produced in Israel, and this is, you know, Samson hits all of them with his fire. So he's, he is, <laughs> he is systematically punishing them for this. He has thought this thing through, and he knows what he's doing. Now, I want you to keep in mind, contrast what he's doing here and what he's going to do with how the other judges have acted. What have the other judges done? They've had Amalekites to deal with. They've had Ammonites to deal with. You know, they've raised an army. They've ended up having battles. And at the end of their reign, it talks about how many years they served as judge. And it says, and they delivered Israel from its enemies. And there's that refrain through most of the judges. But you don't read that refrain here. Because Samson's not delivering Israel from its enemies. Number one, part of the time he's spending time with Israel's enemies. He tries to marry a woman of the enemies. He creates drinking parties with his enemies. And then when he gets angry, then he tries revenge against his enemies. But it isn't for the nation. Primarily, it's out of his own anger, right. uh -huh. his own upsets that this occurs. You know, this is not, I think, the way God intended his gifts to be, this gift of great strength. So what happens here? The owners investigate, and it becomes pretty obvious who did this one. Samson, of course, uh, is picked out. He did this, and so the Philistines then... Number one, decide after they find out why he did it, that is, that the father, the Temanite, gave this daughter to another man, they decide first, well, they're done. And so they kill them. They burn their houses down and burn them to death. And they, they die. You know, matter of fact, if you remember back in uh, chapter 14 and verse, I think, 15. Remember what has happened? If, 
uh, if if the woman, the Philistine woman, won't get the information about the riddle for them, what do they threaten? Burn their house down. Oh, so they do it, and they burn their houses down and kill them, which would be, I think, a pretty horrible way actually to die in a house fire like that. So, yes. Okay. Okay. Not the version of, in Matthew, but the Psalms one. Okay. Yeah. So it uses that word there. Good job. <laughs> okay. So now. Apparently, Samson intended to stop his revenge here, but then, of course, they kill his kind of going to be, but didn't be, wife. So now he gets angry again, okay, about that. And he decides, of course, then he's going to get even for the death of his wife. Now, here we see, of course, the cycle of revenge. Now, I want to look at a number of verses concerning this, but one of the things you see about revenge is it's one of the most instinctive things in human nature. When we're wronged, we want to get even. It's absolutely instinctive, and it's very difficult not to do. All right? It's very difficult not to do. Uh, because it's so ingrained in human nature. Let's look at the most famous, probably of all the verses, on the issue of revenge, and that's Romans 12. Let's read it to start out. Sorry, verse 17. Never pack, pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is in the right in the, in the sight of all men. If it's possible, uh, as far as it depends on you, mm-hmm. be at peace with all men. In other words, don't provoke a fight in that situation. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave l- room for the wrath of God, for it is written... And this is the important verse here. Mm-hmm. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Mm-hmm. God is the only one that can rightfully avenge because he's the only one who rightfully understands justice. Mm-hmm. We see it in very limited and relative terms. God sees the issue perfectly. Mm-hmm. And so he's the only one that can avenge it correctly. And then the opposite, of course, here. Quoting again from the Old Testament, but if your hungry is if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in do so, you're, you're heaping burning coals upon his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but rather overcome evil with good. Now, the history of the world is really has a lot to do with cycles of revenge. Now, I I just I'm picking just a few of them, and there's thousands of them that you could talk about. But every cycle of events in human history assures tragedy and assures future tragedy on it. Because, of course, think about, I'll give you one. Back when there was the tremendous, uh, uh, essentially, civil war between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, how many years were British soldiers on the streets of Northern Ireland, how many times did they arrest individuals who they believed to be terrorists against Britain? Those people were either killed in shootouts or arrested, put in prison. And so what was the result? For what? I think probably went on for 20 years, didn't it? At least. least, Okay. Then, of course, you had this very... uh, the, The Northern Ireland underground became very sophisticated at making bombs, right? And they would do the most atrocious things 
you know, if there was some public event, if they could blow up a series of public buses, if they could blow up public buildings, you know, that's what they do. For the maximum effect, they would blow these places up. And it was horrific, you know. Yes. It also says, you know, if you pray for your enemy. Yes. I find that excruciating. It is. <laughs> it is. I know. It's, uh... I'll Jack. pray that they'll get justice. Yeah. 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 I know. Something comes in the first place. This is a real rebel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Jack. If there are exceptions, one would be, would be Hitler when he was trying to take over the world and kill all the Jewish people. I think the, the, the free world had to defend itself. It did. And there's many examples of that. This, this verse about seeking revenge is different than responding to evil. Mm -hmm. They're not the same thing. There is a, there's many commands in the Bible to oppose evil. Okay? That, that's a different thing. Revenge tends to be a more personal issue that involves how I feel wronged and how I'm going to seek to get even. Is it a matter of the heart? Isn't it? it is a matter of the heart. It's true. Is that true? In other words, revenge is whether it's true or not, but you're still going to do something about it. Basically. Yeah, you're going to take it in your own hands. Whether it's true or not. Right, yeah. because you perceive it to be an injustice. I think it's, I mean, if I see someone hurting someone else, maybe just not me, but like hurting them in my family, you know, I'm going to I don't want to call it revenge. No, no, that's... I don't want to call it a defense. Exactly. That's, and, of course, we have many, many, many examples where God says, especially Old and New Testament, but we're supposed to defend the weak, you know, protect those who can't defend themselves, the downtrodden. No, that's not... Opposing evil is a different thing than seeking revenge. I actually wanted in that chapter, I think it's the next one, or after that, Terrible story about the revenge. Yeah, exactly. There's a yeah, the revenge cycle about the tribe of Benjamin here. It's kind of stopping something where revenge is going beyond that to even more. E yes, yeah. You know, you think about and there's so many other examples. I won't go into them, but think about the ethnic wars in the former Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. That was a horrific horrible several years of, I mean, the deaths, the sniping, the assassinations, the, I mean, it was just, it just made a living hell of that area. And, and, and we see cycle after cycle of this. So now I'm not going to go into all these tonight. You can read them for yourself, but I'm going to give you some good verses on don't seek revenge. There's a lot of them. And you'll be surprised how many of them are in the, in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, 35 talks about not seeking revenge. Leviticus 19, 18. Proverbs 10, verse 12. Proverbs 24, verse 29. And then in the New Testament, beyond the Romans 12, we have Ephesians 4, 31. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, Matthew 5, verses 38 and 39. Those are just some of the areas to talk about don't seek for revenge. Well, we're to mm -hmm. I do not say I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord. Yes. Will yeah, there's a lot more, but I just... Mm -hmm. I'm just pointing out there's a lot of them. Old and New Testament about... <laughs> It was Ephesians 4.31. 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2, 21-23. Okay? Now, so, since now his, quote, wife has died, he now seeks a new revenge. And you'll see here uh, that, let's go back to our text so it says in verse 8 and he struck them ruthlessly with a great slaughter and he went down and lived in the cleft of the rock of Edom now interesting phrase here in the Hebrew 
he attacks the Philistines again, and the word ruthlessly is the word shalak, and it means literally leg upon thigh. And it's an image of wrestling, but it implies incredible brute force. Now think about it. With the force that he had, where he could actually pull pillars down, we'll see next time from a temple, literally it means that he was tearing these people limb from limb. Oh, more than that, I think he was probably ripping them off. Okay, It was a very brutal display of force that he was using against them. So after he's done with this, then he goes to this area called the Rock of Edom. Uh, it's, Edom means a rocky cleft or a shallow cave. And of course, it's interesting about, of, you know, why did he retreat there after he had done this? But what we see, and we're going to see in the next verses, is that he's not being the deliverer of Israel, but rather he provokes local fights for selfish reasons. Now, turn, as a New Testament example of this application, turn it back all the way to James chapter 1. And we'll read what James says. James chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 17. He says, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. Now think about it. I started back there because every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is coming down from above. That's what Samson inherited, literally before he was ever, practically before he was conceived. Mm -hmm. He was given all these gifts, and yet he didn't use them the way they were intended to be. Now go to verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren, and let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Why? Because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And this, of course, is not only his problem, but, of course, is our problem. Now, let's read verses 9 through 13. Back in our uh, chapter in Judges 15. Then the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and spread out in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? And they said, that is the Philistines, we have come up to bind Samson in order to do to him as he did to us. In other words, kill him. <clears throat> then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, did you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us. And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. Okay, let me uh, go to verse 13. And then they said to him, <clears throat> we've come down to bind you so that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you'll not kill me. So they said to him, no, but we will bind you fast and give you into their hands. Yet surely we will not kill you. Then they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. So now we go to the next step of this process. Notice, if you would, turn over a little bit to your right to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. And we're going to read 
starting verse 19. We've read this before, but I want to remind you. Now, no blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords for, and, or spears. So all of Israel went down to the Philistines, each to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, or his hoe. And it talked about the charge they did in verse 22. So it came about on the day of battle that neither sword nor spear was found in the hands of any of the people who was Saul and Jonathan, etc. So the Philistines did what any invading force that occupies the land does. They take away any weapons that the populace has, which should make you think carefully. Yes, should make you think carefully about the current battle over the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Just remember, as our founding fathers said, if the people don't have access to their own weapons, then only the government has them. And, of course, the whole point of the Second Amendment was not to go hunting for deer. It specifically said that in the case that the government should become no longer the servant of the people and needs to be repulsed, that's why the Second Amendment was instituted. In the same way, the Philistines had taken all weapons away from the Jews. So the Jews were helpless. So they come, the Philistines come to them and basically say, you know, we're going to go get him, probably saying, and we're going to punish you if we don't, undoubtedly. So these 3,000 men of Judah decide, okay, we'll go get him. So they come down, of course, to the Rock of Edom. Now, basically what they say is interesting. They say, what have you stirred up against, you know, and, and what misery have you caused us? And so they're upset with Samson, even though he's attacking the Philistines, their enemies. But they don't want the boat rocked. They're content with being occupied. They're content, sadly, with the situation that they shouldn't be content with. And the whole point of the, of the judges being given was to deliver them from their enemies. But they're content. This is, the, is this the first time that they didn't turn to God and ask him for deliverance? Uh, yes, yes, you're right. It's a good point. They didn't. It, the refrain is not there. So I think it's interesting to note that in the 20 years of Samson's judgeship, this is the first time we have any evidence that Israel raised any army of any sort. And who's it against? Samson, not the Philistines. So it's, a, it's quite a sad indictment there. Now, Samson, I think, decided not to spill Jewish blood in the situation. And he agrees to be bound and be turned over. And so they deliver him here at this place called the Rock of Edom. And uh, it's interesting that here he is, I think, in the greatest sense, alone. There's really no one there for him. He's alone really by himself in this situation. So uh, let's go ahead and now read verses 14 through 17 back in uh, Judges. So when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted as they met him, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily so that the ropes that were on his arms were as flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds dropped from his hands, and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. So he reached out and took it and killed a thousand men with it. Yeah, now think about that. Israelites? No. Yeah. These are Philistines. They, they remember, they, they, the Jews have, have delivered him over to the Philistines. They shout, we, in essence, we got him. We got the guy, okay? And, of course, then it says in verse 16, and, and then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have killed a thousand men. 
And it came about when he'd finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand and he, re- and he named that place Ramoth uh, uh, Lehi. That was one heavy duty Yeah, so of course we're going to look at that for a minute. So what happens is at the moment at which he's turned over to the to the Philistines, okay? The Holy Spirit then activates him again with great strength. And the ropes, it says that they fell off him. The word there in Hebrew means melted, literally melted off his hands. In other words, it was like nothing that he broke them because of the power that the Holy Spirit gave him. He sees this fresh jawbone. The word is... Uh, Terry Yaha, I'm certain I mispronounced that in Hebrew, okay? But it, it, what it means is that it's the, uh, the jawbone of a recent, relatively recently killed uh, donkey. So in other words, it has, it's, it's a green bone, if you want to put it that way. It has flexibility and strength, and it's not brittle. And this is what he grabs. And of course, in fury... He slaughters a thousand Philistines. Now, just picture that for a moment. Think about killing 1,000 people in a relatively short period of time. Imagine a thousand bodies lying around in probably multiple heaps, but still undoubtedly in heaps. I mean, that's an incredible level of carnage that goes on. Uh, it would be almost look like practically a disaster site if you if you imagine it. So after the slaughter, almost like his riddle in the previous chapter during the you know drinking party, uh, his quote wedding party, he ends up uh, saying a, this kind of poetic statement, and it's interesting. In the Hebrew, the word for donkey is. Hamor, and in Hebrew, the word for heap is homor. So it's, it's this almost poetic-sounding word-for-word little riddle or, or parable that he gives. It's, he's using really kind of a play on words, and if you, I think the best translation that I found would be this. With the jawbone of the ass, I piled them in a mass. <laughs> That's pretty much what he's saying, okay? And if you look, if you try to translate it in Hebrew. No, it's not really. It's not. So he finishes killing them, drops the jawbone, and names this place uh, Ramoth Lehi, which means the hill or mounds of the jawbone, okay? The results of using this jawbone. Okay, now... 18 through 20, and we'll finish the chapter here. Then he becomes very thirsty, and he called to the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance by the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. But God split the hollow place that is in Lehi so that water came out of it. When he drank, his strength returned, and he revived. Therefore, he named it uh, En Hakore, which uh, is in Lehi to this day. And then the final phrase, so he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. All right. So he's exhausted and he's thirsty. And you can imagine he would be pretty thirsty with the exercise it would take to kill a thousand people and create a slaughter like that. It's a miracle, of course, that he can do it. He's, in, he's strengthened by the Holy Spirit. And then he turns around and essentially accuses God of letting him die from thirst. <laughs> now, have you ever heard this before? Does this sound familiar to you? Tell you, where have you heard it before? In the wilderness? Oh, yeah. In the wilderness? Yeah. And, I'm sorry. Yeah, he was in the but, yeah, but, well, yeah, it's true. Well, he was complaining of the heat. It was his 
thirst. Yeah, in the thirst, right, and because he wanted this plant to grow over him yeah. to protect him. How about in Exodus 14, verses 22 through 27, when the people, of course, come through after they, you know, they've been led by a, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of, fl- of, of uh, fire, by fire by night, now, you know, they, you know, they, they, the, the, this Red Sea is miraculously parted. They walk across to this dry land. The sea closes. The Egyptian army is devastated. They get on the other side, and what's one of the first things they say? We're going to die. We're gonna die. Not enough water. The meat and the wonderful thing. Exactly that we had in Egypt. So he experienced the supernatural feat. But at the same time, he could not believe that the Lord would provide him water. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Now, we can think about this and say, why? What a dumb guy for this. Turn, hold your place here, and turn to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to start. In verse 25. I think I wrote it down wrong. Let's go to (laughs) 6. I wrote down wrong, sorry. Chapter 6, verse 25. For this reason, I say to you, don't be anxious about your life as to what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, nor do they reap, nor do they gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not much more, are you not much more important than they? And which of you, by a single, uh, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow; that they don't toil, nor do they spin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Down to thirty-one. Don't be anxious then, saying, "What shall we eat? What shall we drink?" Again, the refrain over and over again. Uh, or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek, for your Father knows that you need these, but rather seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Every day has enough trouble of its own. So we can look at what Samson does, but we do the very same thing. Isn't it amazing how quickly, after God delivers us from something that we've been praying about, something that's upsetting us, a situation, a person we can't get along with, whatever it is, and there's a resolution, and how long does it usually take before we're again, next, complaining? (laughs) But what about this? This isn't right either, you know? I'm, you know, so it, you know, Samson did it, but it's, it's human nature, we tend to do it also. So God, again, like he did at Horeb, splits a rock, and water pours forth, and he he drinks the water, and he's revived. And uh, it's interesting uh, uh, that as a result of this, uh, that God provides for his need, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, as, as he certainly will ours also. Now, Samson names this place, as we said, En Hakore, which, is, which in Hebrew means the caller spring. In other words, Samson called out to the Lord, and the Lord dis- answered him despite really kind of a faithless attitude. As it says here, it concludes that he judges Israel for 20 years, but unlike the ending with the other judges, it doesn't say that he delivered Israel from its enemies because he ends up really not delivering Israel from his enemies. And God still let him judge. He still let him judge and still works with him, this very imperfect man. This marks really the beginning of the further decline in Samson's life where his immaturities, his lusts, and his desires finally lead 
to his own downfall and finally his own death. And that's what we'll go through next week in the next chapter. So that's the 15th chapter. Okay? So why don't we... Very, it's very tragic. It's a very tragic uh, story, uh, and yet it says so much about human nature, doesn't it? Okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Michael Landrine, would you finish us with prayer? Oh, yeah. Um, Lord, just, just thank you. Thank you for allowing us to gather here tonight. Our country is in dire straits, Lord, but we know that you put you put all these people in charge of our country. It isn't happenstance that they're there. And you have all the ability, all the power, all the glory to direct us from beginning to end, Lord. And we need to understand that you're running the show and nobody else is. So tonight, in our little gathering here, we want to thank you that we live in this country and that we can gather and that we can observe your day of the month and the week and have Bible studies and, and all the wonderful things that you have graciously allowed us to have. So with that, we all want to thank you for you yourself, Lord. Mm-hmm. Amen. 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 Amen.